everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Pete Wright, and right over there is Nikki Kinzer. Hello. Hello, Pete Wright. Oh, hello. Uh, hello. How are you? I'm doing well. Hello, everybody out there. Uh, boy, it's a big, big weekend, Nikki. Big weekend. Pokemon. Pokemon came out. Took my son to see Pokemon the movie. Really? Detective Pikachu. Did yeah. you like it? Yeah. Mm. Not really. Okay, well, as a movie nerd, it 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 succeeds at doing exactly what it needs to do. Okay, little, entertains little people. Bitty, bitty movie. It, it's a kids' movie. Ryan Reynolds is funny because he's always funny, mm-hmm. even with a lackluster script. And if you if you play any of the Pokemon games, if you if you've been collecting the cards for the you know t- last twenty years, uh, this is a this movie is a giant Easter egg. And clearly, the people who made the movie have a lot of love for it. And that is awesome. It's also a product movie. Like, it just wants you to love the products yeah. even more. And I, so as somebody who plays the the, the game with my son, right. I really enjoyed it because I totally speak the language. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's my language. And we had such a fun, like, father-son jam oh, at that movie. Oh, that's so nice. Do, if you don't play the, if you don't play it, don't, don't go. Don't go see the movie. You're not gonna. You're not gonna understand it. Like right. it's like in. It might as well be in Japanese right. if you don't like play the game. So, uh, but but that was our big. Uh, that was our big pre Mother's Day thing. And then we had Mother's Day, which is very exciting. So happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there, yes. uh, and all the wannabe moms, and all the former moms, and all the moms. Uh, uh, just much much love uh, out there to to you. All right. So, can we talk about my thing? What's your thing? It's been nagging me since our conversation with Dr. Hallowell last week. Mm. Loved that conversation. God, he's he is the man. Yeah, uh, he really is the man. He he introduced us to this book that he's right. That he's written that is all done, but isn't going to come out until next year, which is crushing. Right. Uh, called Finding Your Right Difficult, and that concept has been really nagging me. Uh, and, and in the concept, the context of ADHD, and I want to talk all about that. I want to talk about patience. I want to talk about being a late bloomer, and I want to talk about. People who are late to understanding what a late bloomer is. Uh, I want to talk about all of that uh, this week, thanks to another new book that I've just discovered. Before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com to get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list, and uh, we'll let you know by email each time a new episode is released. Of course, you can find us on Twitter or Facebook at Take Control ADHD and all the other podcast applications out there. Overcast is fantastic and a Downcast and Pocket Casts, and these are all great. Radio Public is fantastic. We've had a couple of people on our Discord channel uh, ask, uh, r- remind them, what what is that podcast app Pete was talking about? Radio Public is great. A- and yes, we're on Google Play and Spotify too, but uh, you know, <laughs> they're last on my list. Okay. I, I have an email from listener Dave, what who is amazing. What does Dave have to say? Well, so listener Dave wrote us a long time ago, back in the days of March, the days, the <laughs> early days of March. And he wrote from Massachusetts and he said he was he just started listening to us a, a month ago and uh, that he uh, he was set to go in for an assessment. Right. Mm-hmm. This was like he was excited about the show and he wanted to share that enthusiasm and getting educated on ADHD. He said, I think I think this is me. I think this is who I am, but I need to go in for an assessment. And so we exchanged a couple of emails after that initial one. And I just want to share a note, a public shout out, a billboard of congratulations, because listener Dave has written in and he said, hey, Pete, I just wanted to follow through and let you know that my evaluation concluded this week. And after a very intense couple sessions, I have a diagnosis which confirmed my suspicions. ADHD with a companion diagnosis of anxiety and depression. After getting the news, I felt such a cluster of conflicting emotions as you would expect, but I'm on a path now that looks much more real than anything I've been able to imagine in the last 10 years. I'm not sure where to go from here, but I know I have to work every day to stay on this path and stay focused on improving my everyday life, one baby step at a time, right? Thanks again for the wonderful podcast. I look forward to every new episode, and I resonate with everything you have to say, your perspective, and how you respond to your struggles. Have a great weekend, Dave. Dave, uh, thank you for Mm. following up, for writing in and sharing that note because uh, it it is worthy of great congratulations to follow through and actually get the diagnosis confirmed uh, because that's hard to do. That's just 
it's just hard to do and and so you deserve you deserve the kudos kudos from us kudos from the community um it's it's great and uh welcome welcome to the club that's awesome yes yeah. i love the follow up too i think that's great yeah. that he wanted yeah. to to let us know where he's at so that's that's great congratulations yeah. dave okay so here's the thing that was that was nagging me about finding the right difficult nikki yeah Kinsley. what is it why does it take so long for those of us with ADHD to find our jam? Well, Why does it take so what long? do you mean by jam? Like, this was the thing that he said in this, the premise of, of Dr. Hallowell's book, right? Ned, Ned Hallowell's new book. He's writing this book it's called Finding, Your, Finding the Right Difficult, mm-hmm. is that you need to find the challenge that is both inspirational enough to you that you are able to overcome the obstacles in the path to mastery, right? To excellence. Right. That's, that's how I heard it. Is that how you heard it? Um. Yes. I. You know, I think you probably... I think you've been thinking about it more than I have. And so... <laughs> <laughs> like, well, you've had a busy week. I remember... Yeah, I've had kind of a busy week. Yeah. So, because I remember him mentioning the book and I remember thinking the title was fantastic because it's just a really great title. But then I think what I um, resonated more was with his autobiography. Like when he yeah, was talking right. about that, I was like, oh, I really want to read that book too. And I want to read this book when it comes out in like 2020. So to me, it was like, it felt so far away. So uh, I'm just going to say, yes, I agree with you. (laughs) Because (laughs) I have really nothing else to really follow that up with. So yeah. Well, no, I'll tell you what it what it was for me is he, he kept saying like writing was his difficult, right? Writing right. was the thing where he could sit down and write. And even though it was hard, it was it, it was sort of uh, it, it induced him to keep going. Right. That was the thing that he could engage his hyper focus when needed. He could persevere through the challenges and and actually, you know, get the job done. And he found his jam. Right. That was his difficult. Okay, that was the thing that allowed him to eventually succeed. Right. We're not talking about strawberry jam or grape jam. We're talking but about we could. writing. I mean, jam. if you just literally needed, maybe you need to be a berry farmer, and that is and that's your literally jam. your jam. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, uh, it it just starts started making me think. Why does it take so long? And and what are the skills that come with, um, you know, having to constantly revisit this search for whatever comes next in in our right in our search for for whatever our difficulty is whatever career success is why do we have to to keep revisiting and is that is that a, a thing that normal people have to do with have to deal with right like what is it like in our culture today that that makes that a reality for for us and then i found this other book this really? interview just this weekend uh and this one uh, this one's really been nagging me. I haven't finished the book. The book just came out, so I'm about halfway through it. Uh, and it is by uh, um, a young man. I say young man. He is the editor of Forbes. His name is Rich Carlgard. You've heard of Forbes. Oh, of course. Like, right. magazine. magazine. Uh-huh. So uh, for, he, he publishes Forbes. He has spent a career celebrating the culture of, you know, earnings and achievement and the rat race. And his previous books are like Team Genius, the new science of high performing organizations and the soft edge where great companies find lasting success. Right. I mean, he's he's very much kind of a future thinker, future forward, the value of moving fast and and doing amazing things uh, and and celebrating the 30 under 30 great right. people, young young entrepreneurial women under 30, right? I mean, they have all their special issues. Right. And, and really, they're, they're like, they are taking part in a culture of achievement, an aggressive culture of achievement uh, that uh, is, uh, I, I think it's hard once you once you're 31 to to start thinking, gosh, is this really the way I live? Am I done? Like, should I just put a fork in it? That is like, really nothing... depressing. It's really depressing. <laughs> yeah. And so I was so interested to see this book that just came out April 19th. His book, Rich Carlgard, editor of Forbes, write Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement. The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement. Well, isn't that a little ironic. Well, it makes me think that Rich Carlgard just turned 31. 
And right? he's wondering, like, like, what's going on. <laughs> right, right. right. He didn't, I've got to change fact, my angle a little bit. Yeah. Well, and this is what's so interesting about this for me is that, you know, he clearly he's a seasoned professional. He's had decades in the business as a, both an editor and a publisher and a writer and and a reporter. And um, and, and in, you know, Silicon Valley, he certainly has certainly has a, a unique if sort of uh, like I uh, um, uh, sort of fishbowl uh, view of of what achievement is in technology Mm -hmm. in the technology sector, pharmaceutical sector, and things that happen in Silicon Valley that don't necessarily happen outside of Silicon Valley. Um, And and so I started kind of rifling through this. I listened to a couple of interviews. He did a TED Talk uh, and that that I thought was really... So I I really kind of dove in headfirst, and I want to share a little bit about what what he's getting at and talk about the, the connections that come to this celebration of achievement and how his perspective is impacted by the idea that we have to we have to slow down and we have to take advantage of experience and we have to look at 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 how the world has changed and and um, how we may be taking part in a negative cycle um, of you know that's leading to negative things and how I think my theory is we with ADHD especially adult diagnosis uh, we've been doing this all along so welcome to the party pal you That's know right. you, yeah. you know what I'm saying all right um, so he starts with this premise on racial diversity and gender diversity and gender identity diversity that all of these things we're doing our best to uh, to to uh, be welcoming to so many different perspectives we're trying so hard even when it's really hard to know that we're trying hard to be welcoming and woke to all of these different categories of diversity, right? Diversity of thought, diversity of race, diversity of gender, and that makes teams better. But one area and one of the premises that uh, that I'm dealing with that he presents here is that cognitive diversity is not judged the same way uh, as other kinds of diversity. If you're not a prodigy, right? If you're not in the best kindergarten, if you're not in the best schools, if you're not, don't go to the best colleges, if you're not accepted into the Stanfords and the Ivies, that that there is a celebration of those who achieve that kind of cognitive difference, and everybody else is disregarded, right? That's kind of one of his premises. But, what do you think about it? How does that hit you? Well, I, I absolutely agree. And what's interesting about it is I had never really thought of it that way, right? I mean, because you're, you're, you're so right. It's like we're always looking at the the other type of diversities and, or, you know, what, what, how does diversity help us in teams and in schools? And I mean, all of that, we want that diversity in our world, but you're right right, when it comes to achievement and when people hit certain achievements, it's a different ball game, a completely different uh, way that we look at that. And you also think about it just like learning. That's also what kind of what connected with me as a child. If you're learning, you know, you're in a learning environment and our school systems are so set up for one type of learning that we're not giving our students that diversity of learning in a different way either. Well, that is an interesting, interesting observation. One of the things that he talks about is uh, how we are able to find the standout achievers. Right. And he starts by talking about athletics, particularly football and, and baseball and, and basketball. And and um, he he says, you know, we have it's very hard to be a good player and not be discovered at some level. Right. Because we have filter upon filter upon filter from parents to boosters to coaches to recruiters to, clubs, you know, college club sports, clubs, all of yeah. these things. Right. If you show any modicum of promise. You'll be found if you want to do it. Like, if you show that kind of standout promise, you'll be found. And his premise is, this: does the same kind of standout performance, like, filtering happen in other areas, particularly for like if you didn't bloom on time, right? Mm-hmm. If you didn't hit that those milestones of expectation, if it if it took you until you were 35 to figure out who you are when you grew up, uh, then how do you get discovered? If you've already been disco- d- discarded, so to speak, right. culturally discarded, how do you get discovered? Again, we don't have the filters that account for that. And and I thought that was an interesting parallel. I don't know how, you, you know, I don't have a sense for how true it is, mm-hmm. um, how, how real it is, but that was his assessment. He interviewed Carol Dweck. We've talked mm-hmm. about Carol a number of times on the show, the author of Mindset. And, uh, you know, her book, the research she had done for her book was back in 2006, and she's been constantly updating it 
it. And she had gone through the process of updating it in the last uh, two or three years. And uh, Carl Gerard interviewed her and said, what's different about the kids that you interviewed in 2006 who got into Stanford, those freshmen, and the kids who are getting in as freshmen today? And mm-hmm. she said, oh, well, the kids who get in today, they're freshmen, and I sit down to talk with them, and they're already brittle, exhausted, and broken. And is that because they've worked so hard to get into Stanford? Like, the the steps to getting into any university is different than it used to be? It, well, the pressure. I, I, I think so. I mean, I think that's oppression. Look at what they've come up against. Look at what we've created. And I'll say that this is, you know, potentially a uniquely U.S. centric perspective. Right. right? And we're just going through this right now. You know, my daughter this week is sitting down for an AP econ exam at the college across the street and she's got, you know, SATs and ACTs that she's taken. And 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 so, you know, here we are. We've created this system where we start them early, very early in reading and math. And then we proceed to test the hell out of them for, you know, 12 years until we give them one final test for three and a half hours. And their achievement on that test likely determines the availability of options in front of them. And that just makes even me so if, sad. Well, it is sad. And and even if, you know, here I am from my perspective now, decades after that experience, and I can say with, you know, great enthusiasm as somebody who has spent years educating college students and graduate students that there are all kinds of second chapters. Right. That doesn't matter. My perspective doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that when she is 16, my daughter has been at taught that this matters more and the weight anything. of the world is on this test. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That's that's the problem I think that that we have is like that that race has been has been inculcated in our cultural understanding. So the ADHD perspective, I feel like I've been fighting this, uh, banging my head against this all my life, that that, uh, that that's at the root of all of the shame that comes with doing well. It doesn't matter if you do well, if you don't do it first, right? If you're not mm-hmm. at the top of your class, if you're not first in an industry, if you're not first to publish, if you're not first to release, you know, uh, there was always that race. So that feeling of being behind high performers, it, it's not some new cultural eruption for those of us li- living with ADHD, right? It's Monday, 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. That's that's mm-hmm. how we live with it. So I don't know. Am I talking about something that you relate to in the, the clients that you work with? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, well, and it's just interesting to, it's just a different perspective. Like I really haven't sat and thought about this. And so you're bringing up some really good points. Also kind of depressing when it comes to the school systems, just because I think it has changed so much when we were getting into college and just uh, yeah. in the athletics, especially, too. I mean, the athletics are awful. It's like you have to be in a club sport to ever even be considered to be on the high school team now, you know, yeah. and if you're not in the club, then you're not going to be considered to be a college athlete where it used to just be the high schools. I mean, the whole thing has just really been changed. It has changed. and There's a lot of pressure. Well, yeah. And I would say even beyond just the systems that, I mean, the systems that are created around, you know, the school systems and the sports systems, those are systems that are created around, you know, the parents who are part of it and yeah. the, you know, administrator. I mean, it's just, we did this together. We sh- this, certainly did. We all right. <laughs> share right. responsibility here. And I, I don't want it to come off like I'm just showing up here to complain about, you know, recruiting systems because I'm really not. Like, right. I think we, we share responsibility both in how we got here and frankly, how we, get ourselves out of it. And if you've ever felt this kind of pressure, living with ADHD, if you've ever felt like the race is something that causes you shame and uh, and the, is is something that you are being judged, which I have and I mm-hmm. feel like I'm I'm coming at that from a place of ex, of, of expertise and you're not uh, alone at least empirically and I'm people. not alone, but I don't want to speak for for all y'all, right? Uh I, then I think this is worth thinking about. So right. one of the things that he has, has pointed out that I thought was interesting, it, it comes from the work of uh, a gentleman named, uh, he's a NYU City University neurologist uh, named uh, Elkonen Goldberg. That name is fantastic. E-L-K-H-O-N-O-N. Elkonen. 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 He sounds like he's out of Dune. The Baron Elkonen. That's right. Oh, nerds are going <laughs> to love that. Um 
So he has done some research. And you know, we, we talk about this thing, executive functioning, this part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex doesn't actually finish developing until 25. Get a load of this. He has, he is kind of, he's, he's on the frontiers, right? And I don't know that there are a lot of the, in the neuroscience community that agree with him yet, but he's really pushing on this boundary. And he is suggesting, in fact, that many of the functions, the executive functioning parts of our brain, that our brain does not, in fact, finish developing until your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. Right. And he is the the boundary he's pushing on in particular is saying, look, th- there there comes with the, the beauty of experience and what happens in the brain. Right. The neurophysiology of the brain is that it continues to um, to make new connections and is incredibly plastic and allows you to develop what he's calling wisdom. Uh, and he has written a book uh, called, I think, The Wisdom Paradox, something like that. You can find it on his website link in the show notes, where he talks about, like, this is the thing we need to think about. Stop thinking that you just stop developing. Your brain is is baked at 25. We need to let go of that and realize that you can continue to learn and continue to change and continue to develop and uh, and continue to train yourself and be able to contribute in new ways well into, right, what normally we considered finished brain development. You're not done yet. And Whatever you think of of Elkanan Goldberg and his work, right? And I have not read his work. I'm only discovering him today. Uh, I really like the message of you're not done yet. Right. You're just not done yet. You are plastic. You are moldable. You are changeable. It's the growth mindset. Yes. I mean, right. I think it thank, really thank is you, just Carol Dweck, extending right? Right back to it. Yeah, you're extending to that to the growth mindset, and so I have a question though. When he says that the prefrontal cortex and executive functioning only develops in the 30s to 50s, is that no, no, no. that's not what he said. Uh, oh, what I'm he said is notes. there is uh, there is a uh, yeah. My my notes are shorthand. Okay. Um, the the it, what he's saying is we had this that we have there is this accepted kind of norm now that, uh, you know, we talk about it mostly in the context of teenagers who do stupid things, right? I say that in quotes, right? That that you can't expect teenagers to be able to to, to think you know, the way a forty-year-old to, year old to think, think the way a forty-year-old yeah. was, because their brain doesn't finish developing until it's twenty, until they're twenty-five. And what they're talking about there is the prefrontal cortex is not uh, is not developing. Is, is, well, and with ADHD in particular, your motor cortex is baked really early, and that's what causes you to kind of have a lot of energy and move. Well, and that's and, what I was going to ask if this if yeah. this if there was a difference between ADHD and non ADHD. Like, is he talking to just one audience, or is he talking? Um, he's talking about everybody. Just everyone. This is yeah. Conan is not talking yeah. about ADHD. Right. Right. right okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and so that's what we're talking about here is that even in the non ADHD crowd, uh, that there is reasonable doubt as to whether the the brain is finished baking at, yeah. at twenty five. I think that's he, there really is, good news. Well, that's great news. I think it's terrific news. So it it makes me curious to read his books and see just how how you know those who say he might be batty. Why do they say he's batty? Like why is he on the the bleeding edge of this stuff? Uh, and, you know, and I I don't speak neuro neurophysiology, so right. uh, you know I need somebody to translate that. But the the point is uh, that there is opportunity here. So yeah, our our author here, uh, Rich. He has this list of six values, six core values that are that are embodied in the late bloomer. And I really like this list. I really like this list because I read this and I thought, oh, my God, these are my ADHD ADHD. adult pals. Yeah. Yeah. These these are the strengths. I wanted to uh, I wanted to run down them. And so I would like to say them and I would very much like for you to tell me uh, how they how you see them embodied in your ADHD pals Mm -hmm. like me. Mm-hmm. You're my pal. <laughs> Please tell me, tell me think, what you think of me. Uh, number one is curiosity. Late yeah. bloomers uh, are are curious. Absolutely. In fact, in my groups last week, we did a find your strengths um, session where everybody was going to talk about their strengths. And I would say that probably, let's see, I think there was five people in one group. And I, I would say at least two or three people put curiosity as one of their strengths. And that's one of those that you can feel. Like mm-hmm. that's one that you can, it's, it's, it's a strength that you, you know, you have it. Like right. you are the one who's always asking questions. You want okay, more, number two, you want to com- know more. Yeah. Right, right, right. Number two, compassion and by extension, empathy. Absolutely. 
I don't know why that is. I, I, I wonder sometimes if that is because it's easy to look outward when you're always looking outward at other stuff, right? Like when your attention is constantly moving around, it's easy to see the, you know, when attention is needed. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, maybe they're a little more intuitive, like they can see somebody who needs help and they they may have been in that position before and they can see that and they want to help. Yeah, absolutely. On the opposite end of that, I've also seen where, you know, people tend to want to be people pleasers at the expense of their own selves. And that's where you have to kind of be careful. Yeah, it's like that codependent vibe. Yeah, yeah. Or just, right, just doing too much and then getting taken advantage of. How about resilience? Remember this just a few weeks yeah, ago. Pete, few weeks this is ago. a this is a strength of yours. Yeah. Ah, who knew? Absolutely. And this keeps coming up. Absolutely. It keeps coming up. It's important. I I love this one and it I don't know. It makes me think back to my escape room experience and I think maybe this is not exactly true. It's equanimity, ability to be calm under pressure. Uh it's the adrenaline. Yeah, that's so from the studies that I've that I've researched and read about ADHD, a lot of firefighters, um, first responders, you know, people who are Navy SEALs. I mean, these are people who have ADHD because they thrive on the adrenaline and they can be calm under pressure. And, uh, you know, thank God for them. We need them. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. I wonder how much that's a result of just like. You know, if I were sitting down to do my taxes, I'd have to set, uh, you know, alarms to make me do it or stop, you know, playing video games or whatever it is. Maybe it's because I just don't I I, I can become numb to external stimulus, uh, you know, putting pressure on me to think in a, in a certain way. If I'm if I'm in the zone, you know, if I'm if I'm really working under pressure, uh, it's pretty easy to ignore external pressures. Right. Right. You know, I yeah. feel like that's a thing. Uh, this is uh, number five is wisdom. And this is what I was getting at with the uh, uh, Elkhorn and Goldberg work. His book is called The Wisdom Paradox. And uh, that's it might be worth looking up if you're into such things. Um, and uh, the final is persistence. You bet. Number six is don't, persistence. So don't I mean, give listen up. to this. ADHD people, come on. Like he just outlined ADHD. late bloomers, this new thing that late bloomers right. need to continue to to reach. Oh, well, okay. Yes, absolutely. This is we've been living with this since we were diagnosed, since we were 15, since we were 25, since we were 35. This is exactly uh this is this is your life right here. Um one of my very favorite metaphors that came out of this experience, and then I'll then I'll shut up, is uh this idea of repotting. Hmm. And and I really like the way he puts this, especially because, you know, the sun is out right now and it's blue. Things are blooming. Right. Uh, he talks about the fact that there are orchid people and there are dandelion people. Right. And uh, he says, you know, dandelion people, they can thrive anywhere. It's you give so them sun true. and just a drop of moisture and they'll grow everywhere. Yes. Right. Yeah, you they, they but orchid people require a very particular set of conditions and circumstances to thrive. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, in his case, these are, uh, you know, these are the late bloomers, right? People who have taken all their lives to figure out what those conditions are. I would argue sometimes with ADHD, a lot of times with ADHD, we have to think about ourselves in the context of being orchid people. We're orchid Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And to find the right set of circumstances, we have to repot. We just have to stop and say, what I'm doing now is not who I'm meant to be. And that's okay. There is no shame. There is no judgment. It's okay to stop and change. And I love that. So I love what you're saying here in the in the notes you have, because you say repotting is being intentional about the conditions that that make you thrive and taking responsibility to change your circumstances to make sure you bloom. I love it. Intentional. I love that word. One of my favorite words. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I I just I really really resonate with that with with this whole idea. You know that that it, this is this is just we live long lives, and why are we in such a rush in the first twenty years of a life that is a hundred years long? 
Why are we in such a rush? Why do, why do I go to uh, events and, and why am I asked where I went to college? Why does it matter? Why does it matter my education experience from 20 years ago, 25 right. years ago? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Everything has changed since I was there. Right. The fact that I was a Drew grad or a CU grad or a, uh, you know, why does any rational thinking person care about an education experience that was 25 years ago when the world has changed. And I've learned so much more and more valuable information and that I've integrated based on my experience since then. It, it gave me a start that was merely a start for the change that was yet to come. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, I feel pretty strongly about this stuff, and uh, I am excited to see uh, the conversation that comes out of it. So please jump into Discord and let us know. Uh, we really want to hear what you think about this stuff. Great, Pete. They did say, they, this is one thing that he did say that I think was an interesting standout. He said, late bloomers versus ageism, right? There's this, this thing, you know what, aren't we really just being ageist, right? When we say that late bloomers are, are discarded, like if you're over 30, you're discarded. He's, and, and he comes back, he says, you know, there are things where um, this sort of race for the youth in, in professional circumstances is really great. Like you want young people who are in marketing and advertising consumer trends like these. That's where you want these people to be because they have an intuitive sense of what is of trends, what is driving forward, what is cool, what is interesting. But, um, you know, they don't have that wisdom thing yet. And that's OK. They'll get it. They don't have to race to pretend to be wise. They'll get it by just waking up and living every day. Right. And it's, it, it is the next phase of your life. You turn, a, like you just, you have to embrace the next chapter, whatever that next chapter is. So uh, I know that there are some folks in our community who are uh, going through these kinds of changes where they're having to face the idea of repotting. And so it's super resonant to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I just, you know, I want to share to all of those who are uh, facing this. It's you're in the right place to be asking these questions of yourself and of your future. And uh, I'm proud of you. I yeah. love it. Me too. It's great. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> Well, thank you, Nikki Kinzer. You know what I didn't say at all? I didn't say at all uh, to jump into the Patreon. Uh, did I talk about Patreon? I didn't say that at all. I don't think so. But if if you haven't explored uh, the our, our Patreon channel, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast, and you're a regular listener to this show, I sure hope you will jump over there and take a look. And uh, if you are so moved this fine day to throw us a buck or five and uh, jump into the group and join the discord channel our online community it is a flowing river of adhd talk and support and it's amazing uh and uh, and you should check it out uh, again patreon.com slash the adhd podcast we appreciate your support there and for this show thank you for supporting us for paying our costs uh, patrons and for uh, listening to me ramble on today. I hope that something that I've talked about has been moving to you. Uh, and uh, on behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next week right here on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. <laughs>